Namaste and good afternoon, good evening. Um, greetings to all of you from on behalf of Dance Houston. I'm performing for one of my favorite organizations in Houston. And I want to thank Andrea Cody for giving me this opportunity. Love to be working with, uh, with you, Andrea, anytime. And um, I know it says Bharatanatyam Master class, but I'm going to cheat a little bit because uh, I do two kinds of, uh, two forms of uh, South Indian classical dancing. And there are those that are not familiar with the other form as much as with Bharatanatyam, which is uh, definitely a more popular uh, Indian dance uh, form around the world. So I will maybe spend a little time talking about the lesser known one, um, which is kind of important for me. Um, I guess I'm a dual dance cultures in my head. Um, before we do that, I want to speak a little bit about Indian classical dance and what you all see, you see someone dancing and everything looks very simple and easy, but a lot goes into that. And of all dance forms in the world, I've noticed, you know, forgive me for saying this, uh, it's not because I'm a practicing Indian dancer, but the dance form that uses every muscle from the head to the toe, eyebrows, eyes, chin, everything, neck, uh, completely, comprehensively, is Indian classical dance, because we communicate with everything. And it is a complete body language. And so I want to talk about the four different kinds of the four ingredients that go into this complete dance form called Indian. It's all brought, all Indian classical dance forms, all of them. And we call it by the name Abhinaya. Abhinaya means expression. But expression doesn't mean only facial expression. Expression extends to everything else too. So there are four kinds of expressions. And one is expression through your body, your bodily movements, your movements of your arms and of your eyes, and you know, uh, bends, everything, everything, all body movements. And that is one way of expressing yourself. Then there is through not necessarily spoken word because this is not theater, but the music. When someone is singing lyrics, words, we kind of translate them through actions, pretty much like sign language. So that's another kind of expression. The words express a certain sentiment, which is then expressed by the dancer through her body language, through her facial expressions, and you know, um, through um, different means of communication. Then there is the expression which comes from the way you have dressed yourself. Ahari means all the akutramo, as they say. This is you know your head jewelry your bracelets, you know, maybe the rings that you wear, the, the, the bun on the hair, the uh, flowers, the long braid, and the bells on your ankles, your costumes, all the jewelry, the necklaces, everything, all the jewels and everything, the way you dress aesthetically, beautifully, is also a way of expressing yourself as a dancer. And then there is the most important, the last one, where it is your soul that speaks to the audience, not just your, you know, just by wearing beautiful costumes, you may not be communicating with the audience, you may not establish a rapport, no. You can look beautiful, but then it stops with that, unless you know how to attain that, that closeness to your audience to be accepted, for them to feel what you're feeling, and that is the expression that comes from deep within you. These are the four different kinds of expression. And I um, definitely feel that all four exist in Indian classical dance. And uh, I'm going to show you some simple, basic steps. Those that know the dance, you know, you can do with me. Those that don't know, you can try because these are not very difficult. If you're already a dancer, maybe doing some other kind of dancing, some of these positions may look very familiar to you too. Perhaps you do it in your own kind of dancing, like maybe if you're a ballet dancer, your the demi plie would, or the full the full plie, will look very familiar to you. But these are also positions that we hold. In, we are very integral to Indian classical dance. So um, 
we um, warm up also, but the warm up is a very different kind of warm up in Indian classical dance. And uh, we, I make my students do stretching, a lot of stretching. Uh, there, it's mandatory for them when they come to class. They have to be stretching in front of me, so I know they're not cheating. But more than that, it is the 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 basic steps themselves are kind of warm up exercises, and most of us have to practice, have to spend at least thirty minutes doing the basic step before we do our dances, even when we go to class um, or when we practice. So some of these basic steps are very simple and easy to do and fun. And I'm going to show you basic steps in Bharatanatyam, and I'm going to follow the basic steps in Kuchipudi, the other kind of classical dance. And then I'll tell you, you will see the differences for yourself, and you may have questions arising in your mind, and maybe I'll kind of anticipate and give the answers between the two. So the first thing we do is to express, and especially at this time, you know, COVID raging around us, and uh, somehow I feel that the earth is talking to us and telling us, hey, stay off, keep away from me, let me breathe, let me live. And in Indian dance, for some reason, we have all known, always known that. We begin with a prayer, an expression of gratitude to Mother Earth, followed by an apology, which is unusual, saying, I'm now going to stamp my feet and dance. If my feet cause you any pain, Mother Earth, please forgive me. It is a beautiful, beautiful piece of poetry. And I'm just going to sing this uh, chant and I'm going to explain with movements. And you'll see how um, the movements also um, um, will, will tell you exactly the, even with that, if I don't say, you will follow the meaning of the chant just by watching my hands. And it's not a very long chant, I'm just going to say the one which is pertains to the earth. Vishnu Shakti Samupanni Chitra Varni Mahitale Anikaratta Sampanni Bhumi Devi Ramusute Samutra Vasani Devi Parvatasthana Mandani Natyam Karishya Bhutevi Pada Khata Kshamaswami Oh Mother Earth, you that came from the energy and the power of Vishnu. Mother Earth, you that are myriad colored with many precious gems, I bow down to you, O Mother Earth. The oceans are your garments, mountains are your breasts. Before I commence my dance, O oh Mother Earth, forgive me if my feet should cause you any pain. And then we do this. We salute everyone, the audience, Mother Earth, the gods, our mentors, our guru, the one who passed on this art form to us and to all our well wishers, meaning you, the members of the audience. So this is how the namaskaram, as we call it, the salutation, is done in Bharatanatyam. And then we begin with the simplest. It's such a logical style of dancing. It is so. It is so. Um, easy to learn because the progression is very simple. All that we learn first is to maintain this, the position, the demi play position, which is very important. And we don't just, it's not in the course of the movement, we actually hold this position 
through the entire structure of the basic technique, which is pretty painful on the knees, but we learn after a while how important it is and how without this the dance will not look good. The hands are just placed on the waist. If you're a woman, if you're a man, you do this. And in this position, you learn to stamp your feet. So you start with the right foot and you go one, 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 and one. Then it is, as I said, a very logical progression. You go to the two. One, two, one, two. And this way, you keep increasing the numbers. And for a long time, we only practice this because the importance is given to maintaining the position, the sitting position, and learning to stamp your feet so that you hear the sound of your feet. And that way, you will not miss beats. And you get a good hang of the rhythm of every single dance. And then we go on to simple hand movements. So this you can do with me. Your hands, you are, you bend your ring finger, and you you don't stretch your arms completely because you know then the the elbow joint sticks out like this. So you kind of turn in your elbow joint under, and and it's also easier to hold your arms like this rather than straight because then there's tension building up in your arm. So you do one stretch your put all your weight on the bent knee. Extend the other one completely so that only the heel is on the floor. One and two. And then at all times, we learn to look at our hands as we move them. And this is what makes it interesting. Rather than just looking straight and doing, you look like you're disconnected from your dance. So looking at the hands makes it, you know, like you're involved in what you're doing. And you do get involved as you progress to more things. So this is one of the simple steps. One, two. One, two, but we don't see numbers. We make the children learn the syllables that go with them because it's a language. And the language has, you know, there are things that are said and understood. From flat, to heel, to toes, from extending the feet to crossing the foot. So we use the feet now in different positions. And so gradually you add a new component to each step till you have come to the final steps where you increase the speed of the step. And once you have learned to go in the first speed, second speed and third, slow, medium and fast. And when you have perfected the movement in the third speed, you're ready to learn dances because most dancers do not utilize steps only in the first speed. Many of them have movements in the third speed. So the steps, there are some where the coordination is a little harder and hopefully you can try this with me. Your hands, two fingers to the thumb, and you do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen. So, what you've done is while your foot is going sideways, linear movements, only to the side and going hard in the back. But the movement is directly to the right side, to the center, to the left side, to the center. The hands, on the other hand, are doing circular movements. So the feet are going straight, the hands are making circles. There are lots of lots of geometry used in Indian dance. And you can and this is one of the harder things to do. Uh, you learn the hang of it as you start doing it slowly. That's how that's the reason why we start everything very slow. So you get the full movement. So you go forward. So there are four beats to the foot. One, two, three, four. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now we have switched this time. We are not doing the right hand and right foot. We're doing the left hand and right and right foot. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 15 and 16. So we have used right hand, right foot in the beginning for part of the step, then switched 
and done the opposite hand and opposite foot. So here, when the foot is moving to the side, the hand is moving straight up, almost like perpendicular. And that's what happens. So we have circles, lines, angles, all kinds of interesting patterns going on in Indian um, classical dance. And uh, so this is, is a couple of the steps. I will do some demonstration of the, of the dances, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I'm going to do a little bit of Kuchipudi so that you can see um, the way the body is used in both these. It's like speaking, I guess, English to all of you. And I, I suppose when I go home and I speak to one of my friends, I may just jump into my vernacular and my native language or, you know, something that we both know. So that's how it is. You know, you, uh, I go from Bharatanatyam to Kuchipudi and I have two compartments in my head. So, but you will see for yourself that they sound different. They look different. And that is the reason for that. Bharatanatyam used to be performed in temples and was done by very talented, very beautiful women. The teachers were all male teachers. Women did not teach in those days. The men taught and the women were the dancers. They were very beautiful, very, um, they were scholarly, they were, they could sing, they could uh, dance, they knew many languages. And the temples had these long corridors. And so the movements became very linear. Now, when you go to Kuchipudi, which I'm going to be showing you now, I'm going to demonstrate some of the sets. And I will switch back and forth. And I will do a dance in Kuchipudi, a dance in Pratinatyam. And perhaps at the end, you can all join me doing something very simple. That I'll play some music, and you can all do use some of these moments, put them together. So Kuchipudi, on the other hand, was not done by single dancers in temples. It was done outside in the fields, you know, where there was a lot of space. It's done by men done by groups of men because it was a theatrical production. It was a dance drama, not just a solo performance. And therefore, it had a completely different ambience to it. It was very different in content because they were all mythological you know, stories with many, many, many characters. Here, one single woman was portraying many characters. And I will do a little demonstration of that. And he, on the other hand, it was a group of people portraying many characters. So each one had only one particular role to play. And uh, because they were men, they of course had more energy and they could do a lot of different things, jumps, kicks, leaps. And so the, the dance style is very vibrant and very, very, very um, <clears throat> exciting. And that's the first step is a jump. So we don't start with anything so basic. Bharatanatya builds up gradually and is uh, is uh, easier to learn because it makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> Kuchpuri, on the other hand, is kind of, you know, it's like taming a wild horse. You just, you learn and you have to be very attentive in order to absorb and remember the order of the step because they are so different. So we'll start. Kuchpuri Namaskaram is different too. So Kuchpuri, what you do is, it's a very simple Namaskaram. You put your hands together. You step out on your right foot, stretch your hands. First, you pray to the gods first, to your teacher, to everyone else. And then finally, you ask, pray to Mother Earth and ask her to forgive you for causing her any pain. And here starts the first step. And I think you will probably enjoy, uh, kids may have some fun doing some jumping around. And so your hands, first two fingers are your thumb, put you to the thumb. And of, of course, I mean, in, in any dance form, your posture is very important. You have to hold yourself very straight, um, tall, pulling your spine, extending it, and your elbows must always be up, your shoulders down, arms held back. So this is the position. We cannot allow the arms to ever go like this. So from here, you turn your feet out and you go back to the same demi play position that I told you about earlier. But see how it starts. So you jump on the right foot and raise your left foot, toes pointed. Jump on the left foot, jump on the right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot. So what you're doing is when you jump on the right foot, 
you open your right hand like it's a flower. Then you jump on the left foot, you open your left hand. So it's right, left, right. And you look at, at both, you look at your hand. Tam, digi digi te. So the hands, the arm is not moving, everything else is steady. So you're just opening, it's just the wrist that turns. One, two, one, two. So can you all try that? I think we can do that. Ready? Five, six, we'll do it slower. Seven, eight. Tam, digi digi te. So we have started with a jump. And when you go to the next step, really there's no, no real connection between the first step and the second step. And it's also a little more, it becomes a little more complex. So you do two jumps in there. One, two, step on the right foot. Take your left hand up, your left leg up, place it on top. One, two, take it up, place it on the top. So what you're doing is, you're jumping two jumps. This is a particular position of the first one, Kunchitam, where you are jumping and your the weight is only on your toes. From the two jumps here, you step on your right foot. So you're shifting your, your weight to the right foot. And then what you're doing is lifting up your left foot. And they move. They're very aligned with your movements. So you're moving your left hand up, your left leg up. And when your left hand has reached the center, it opens. And then your arm, sorry, your arm and your leg rest. Your left foot rests on your right knee. Your left hand rests on your right wrist. So they are very similar. They end in the same way. One, two, three. So I, I slow down for the three for you so you see the movement. I think I'm going to make myself more comfortable. Okay. So I slow down the movement so you can actually see the movement in slow-mo, but when you count it as one, two, three, pause, one, two, three, pause. Tam digi digi te, tata hatta te, tam digi digi te, tata hatta te. So after three, you pause. And then, this is, this, this, this is the order of the basics of Kuchipuri. But as I said, because there were guys doing it, you know, the, the, the next one is Tam Digi Digi Te, Tata Hatta Te, Tam Digi Digi Te, Tata Hatta Te. So you kick your foot and you stretch. <coughs> and if you are flexible and your foot can go all the way, you actually touch your foot. So this is, and this, all these, these exercises were not only to build up stamina, but also increase your flexibility. So they had a simultaneous. Uh, um, effect or um, result that they were making you build your stamina, increase your, the, the strength in your arms and your legs, your quads, your calf muscles and all that in your back. But they were also helping you extend, stretch your legs and stretch your arms and get become more flexible and more graceful simultaneously. But there are also other movements and I will show you some movements which are um, similar. I have a feeling some of my students are watching this. They must be familiar with some of the steps. The in Bhattanachan, when just like you did one, two, three, four, in Kuchipuri, there is something similar. But see how the body moves. There is a complete uh, twist. It's one, two, three, four, one, two, three. So what you're doing is not just moving sideways, but you're moving forward, and in doing so, you're also twisting your body. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. It gives a certain, a different kind of a grace in the movement. This is graceful too. It's very beautiful. And this is graceful too, in a very different way. So these are the, the different ways the body moves 
and I've just demonstrated a few steps. I want to show you, uh, since we, I'm ending, since I'm ending, um, I mean, I just ended with some Kuchpuri step. I want to demonstrate something um, very, very much uh, like a hallmark of uh, Kuchpuri dance style, which uh, doesn't exist in others. I saw some other dance form using this um, so, so prop, but I think that's a, a, an innovation in that dance form because it never existed before. But give me a second while I bring this to you. And, and this is a brass plate. And this brass plate is very important in the Kuchipuri repertoire. There is a dance, we call it the Tarangam. And Tarangam means a wave. It's taken from um, a compendium of songs and it's called, wrong name called Sri Krishna Leela Tarangini. It's kind of, it's called the sport of the lake of Sri Krishna. So uh, it's like Krishna, the deity, all his many, many, many deeds, his great deeds, all of them are, each great deed is described like a wave. And the many great deeds become all the ripples in this lake, waves in this, in this lake. That's why it's called Tarangini. And uh, I'm doing an excerpt from the tail end of a song, which is very long. There are lots of stories. There's a lot of uh, storytelling, which is one of the most important and the most beautiful aspects of um, classical, Indian classical dance, is the storytelling. Um, the most, um, Often the stories are from uh, Hindu mythology. Now, of course, there's a lot more contemporary themes. But this particular dance is where, at the end of the dance, um, they must have integrated this into dances more as a means of concentration and uh, various um, rhythmic sequences are, um, are performed with the dancer balancing on this plate. So there is a lot of consultation that is needed. And uh, so this is uh, an interesting, uh, very interesting part of uh, the Kuchipuri dance and a very exciting part of it. People always keep saying, can you please do the Karangam like we don't want anything else? But I mean, there are lots of beautiful dances, but this is something which is very, it's like a you know, stamp. This is like, oh, it is Kuchipuri. So, that's why I thought maybe I will show you the one that the dance that is most significant in this uh, particular dance style. And I'm just showing a little excerpt. Please your uh, pencil. Andrea is my sound engineer. Or was I be doing all this myself? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. 
songs which are non-tarangams that have been choreographed in the format of a tarangam but that's uh, that's uh, of course it's permitted uh, so this format of dancing on the plate can be used with any song we can be creative we can be innovative and that's the idea because dance is like a, a, a flowing river it doesn't stop and it's constantly evolving it's uh, constantly Beautiful. So I'm just going to do a very, uh, now I've done something, this was, I did footwork and a lot of the hand movements which are very typical of Kuchipudi dance, but the footwork was not done on the ground, which you saw me doing earlier, it was confined to the plate. But I'm going to use a little bit of the technique of uh, Bharatanatyam and uh, I am going to uh, uh, perform a short um, a piece. I'm, I'm just going to do a very small excerpt from uh, 
um, a dam that had uh, choreographed is called Atilana. Atilana is usually it comes at the end of a, a, a performance, of a solo performance, and it's a um, kind of a, a dance of ecstasy. I guess when, you know, I believe when a river is flowing into the ocean towards the end, it just opens and gushes into the ocean. It's a very similar thing. At the end of a performance, you know, there's a, a sense of uh, uh, some kind of penta, a sense of release, a sense of joy, ecstasy, and all that comes out in Athenana. It is this beautiful feeling for the dancer and even for people who are watching because it is so exciting. And uh, um, I, uh, this is one of my favorites. I teach it to all my students. And uh, except that I'm not too sure if I'm going to be playing the, the uh, which version I'm playing, but hopefully this is not the edited one, then I'll just go to throw me off balance, but I'm going to show you just a, a few of the steps. Is this that 43 oh. seconds or from the beginning? Sure. From the beginning? Um, not from the beginning, from where, where I you had stopped, to. but I had stopped, yes. Okay. talks in different ways. 
uh, there are leaves, there are jumps in Bhritajam uh, and Kuchipudi, but they are done in a different way. And uh, like accents change, the emphasis changes. When I was in India, I used to say laboratory and learned to say it as laboratory. After I came here, there's a shift in which syllable you emphasize. Similarly, in dance styles, what part of your movement do you emphasize? What is more important? The extending of the arm or keeping it straight? The leap or the bend? Everything depends upon whatever style you're doing. So that is exactly what I tried to demonstrate. <laughs> This time is not enough to really do justice, but I'm just searching for the iceberg. Um, I firmly believe that um, a lot of the folk dances also, which were must have been there from God knows when, from the beginning. And every time when people, the laborers, the workers, the farmers, in order to make their work easier, they used to sing, to make time pass quickly. And these songs um, have, uh, many of them have inspired dances. And the dances are um, so different from the classical styles we've seen. And uh, these are just, they're just they folk dances. Therefore, there are no uh, parameters set. In classical dance, we have to follow strict rules. Like, for instance, we can bend and do a pose, but you're not supposed to move your hips. You're not, not supposed to do certain movements or do any excessive body movements. They're supposed to be limited. And um, restrictions are put upon us of how much we can do a certain kind of movement. The folk movement is just an expression of the people. And so there's a lot more. They're jumpy, and then there's a lot of hip movement. And these are all part of the dance. And they're uh, they're beautiful. And they go with the dance. Nobody thinks, oh my gosh, she's moving her hip. Because if she didn't move, then it would the, the folk dance would have lost its beauty. So um, I would like to show you a little bit of a folk dance. But this is something you probably all would like to join and do. because. Uh, folk dances don't require any, um, actually they don't require any training at all. So anyone can do a folk dance. You just get up and dance and just feel, you know, feel good. And so I'm just going to find a song for Andrea to play and we will do this. A lot of our students do know this uh, dance. Many of them have learned it or many of them may be getting ready to learn it. So, huh. hmm. saw it, it's gone again. So, Rafi? Yeah, I wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about this. Um, those of you who have uh, seen the movie The Hunchback of uh, Notre Dame, you probably know Esmeralda, the character from the movie, uh, or if you've read the book, Alexandre Dumas, or if you just have heard the word gypsy, you know that gypsies are wandering, wandering uh, tribes of people. They do not have a specific address. If you, if I ask you where you live, you'll give me an address. If you ask a gypsy, they don't live in any one place for a very long time. They are nomads. They go from place to place. And we've had gypsies. They say that gypsies first came from India. 
and that they came from the northern part of India and traveled and they went to Romania, to Spain, and that's why flamenco music and flamenco dancing are so close to North Indian music and dance, and gypsy dancing is uh, very close to uh, a lot of the North Indian dances. So there, uh, there are uh, lots of similarities, and you know, they have traced the origins of the gypsies. So it's connected, and gypsies are not just confined to the North, there are gypsies everywhere. I grew up saying gypsies when, from when I was a kid. They would come to the house and they would dance outside and ask for money. Or they would be selling things. They would be selling a basket full of fresh flowers. By the way, my jasmine just fell out of my hair. Uh, fresh jasmine flowers, because in India, the women have long hair and they wear jasmines in the hair, in the braid. So they would sell fresh jasmine flowers, skeins of colored thread, packets of needles, and little glass bangles and bead necklaces, all kinds of trinkets. And they would bring a monkey with them and the monkey would be playing around with everyone and passing a little basket. And it was the most wonderful sight. We would wait for the gypsies to come. And they would always sing and dance. I don't know how it was, different gypsies came, but they all sang and danced. So it must have been a part of the, the gypsy culture. So this is a, a song that the classical dancers, way back when, now, you know, just so strict, when you do a classical performance, you better not allow any folk to come in. Classical, it has to be rigid, only classical. You cannot let anything else. But when I was growing up, this folk dance was part of every classical performance by the greatest, the divas of Indian classical dance, of, of Bharatanatyam. So I grew up doing this dance. So for me, it's nostalgia and a, a trip down memory lane. This is called Kurati. Kurati means gypsy. So this gypsy girl is dancing and she has her basket and she is talking about they lived in the, the, the hilly areas of uh, the state and they came down from there because when they ran out of food and there was no work, they would come into the cities looking for our jobs and doing these things and selling things and then they would sing and then they would go away to another place. So, but. They still love the place they came from. So they are singing the praises of these beautiful mountains where they were raised, what they have left behind. They speak about the peacocks that dance when it rains. And they speak about the goats that seem to be climbing up into the trees and uh, as higher and farther than any human being can go because they're so sure-footed. And they, uh, they speak about the land that is so luscious and so green and how the clouds come to rest on the peaks of all those mountains. And then they open up and they send the rain down to bring new life to the earth again. So this is, once again, I began with a prayer to Mother Earth. And so now, toward the end, we're going back to Earth and the beauties of Earth, of mountains, of waterfalls, of rain, of peacocks, of birds chirping in the air, everything that is beautiful in nature, everything that gives us joy. So this is, I guess this is my humble offering to Mother Nature and so the Kurati. Please join me wherever you are, find some space and you follow me and do this because this is a fun dance and you really don't need to know any dancing. If you know it, good for you. If you don't know it, good for you. Look. So don't forget the basket. You're holding the basket on your head.
which is communicating with the face, whatever is felt inside. Because it doesn't matter if it's ballet, Giselle, Swan Lake, when you know the way the way the loop of the body, you can feel the sorrow. And the ecstasy where they, they don't need to smile and move their eyes and like we do in our dance. But the holding of the hand and the the, the way you raise your, your head and the smile to tell you plenty, that is the feeling that is inside that is brought out through the face. And that I hope is able to communicate a little bit with the what we've called sattvika and the expression that is deep within you, where the heart is talking to my heart is talking to the hearts of the viewers. So, uh, unfortunately, I don't know if there's, a, if there's a question and answer. If anybody knows, there's no question and answer. So, I hope you didn't have any questions, which, which means you may have to, if they are my students, you can ask in class. But you notice that those of you who have learned this dance, you notice that I did a lot of different things. But that's what I was saying. Any dance in the world is not static. Then there's something wrong. Dance is an ever evolving, continuously. It's a, like a, like you know, it it recreates itself depending upon the mood of the dancer and the capability of the dancer to create, to add new things to it. So that is what it is, and that's what I have done. And um, for those who are unfamiliar with the Indian dance, when we begin a class or begin performing, and when we end a performance. It is imperative that we once again pray to our teachers. Um, in India, there is a saying which we were all taught when we were kids. And it tells us in the hierarchy of the people that we venerate. And it says, Mata, mother, Pita, father, Guru, your teacher. And a guru is not a term that we can use lightly. Everybody and everybody, anybody cannot be a guru. A guru is someone who's like way, way, way there, who has given you profound knowledge and is not just a mentor, but someone way beyond that who has taught you lessons in life. And uh, so I guess my, my gurus definitely have work, are there. They are up in heaven. Hopefully they are smiling at me. And then the fourth comes God. And they say that if you venerate your father, your mother, your father, and your guru, you have through them, you are venerating God because God is in each one of them. So that's what we do at the beginning and at the end of the class. So I will once again pray to my gurus who gave me this extraordinary art form.